with the 21st pick in the 2014 NFL Draft, the Green Bay Packers select Paha Clinton Dix. It's time for the Packers War Room Podcast. Made me a believer into really thinking that the Packers really could run the table. And that was when I said right away, they're winning the NFC North. The bottom of Jordan Nelson was just a moment that I'll never forget. For him to be able to get behind the corner and, and, and really just catch the prayer, essentially, was just quintessential um, Packers 2016. Like I said, for this team to win two playoff games was uh, just astounding with how beat up they were and, and the, the state of their defense, really. And now, alongside Jacob Westendorf and Cody Bauer, here's your host of the Packers War Room Podcast, Ross Uglum. Hello everyone and welcome back for another episode of the Packers War Room Offseason Podcast. I am your host, Ross Uglum. I'm a writer at Cheesehead TV and PackersTalk.com. And joining me this evening, as always, is Jacob Westendorf from FanRig. Jacob, how are you? Doing well, Ross. Good to be back talking my old position. Excited to do that. And my position for the Cheesehead TV Draft Guide Offensive Lineman tonight. So excited to dig into my group. We're getting ready to do some of the stuff that we're doing for the Draft Guide. So excited to start that stuff. Awesome. And also joining us this evening is our regular co-host, Cody Bauer, the draft expert for Cheesehead TV. Cody, how are we doing this evening? I'm doing pretty good. I'm on about uh, week four of the sinus infection, but finally got some drugs, so hopefully I'll be able to turn around and talk some alignment with you guys. All right. Uh, let's kind of dive into some of the talking points before we dive into this position group. A uh, little bit of, I wouldn't call it news, but some, uh, some light rumor mongering going on uh, the the Packers being linked to Connor Barwin who was a big uh, free agent signee for the Eagles there they're probably trying to get rid of him via trade if that doesn't work out uh, potentially going to be interested in him as a street free agent because of a uh, an outright release Jacob what's your thought on this deal well they're not they're not going to trade for him. I know that that was a name. They probably made the connection because of seeing that the Packers have Clay Matthews and Kyler Fackrell as the only outside linebackers under contract. Uh, but there's, I mean, you put together his contract and uh, the fact that it required draft compensation. Ted Thompson's still the general manager of the Green Bay Packers unless something's changed. And I lived under a rock for the last couple of days, uh, but they're not going to trade for him. Now, if he's released, and something of that sort, where and this market works out, then yeah, he'd be a good free agent signee as a street free agent. That adds some depth to the position, but they're not trading for him by any stretch of the imagination there. Uh, as far as rumor mongering, it's fun to speculate about, but I, as you kind of stated, I wouldn't necessarily call this news, but you know, if the Packers can get a guy like Connor Barwin, he's a good fit in a 3-4 defense. He was a very good piece uh, and some pretty decent defenses in his time in a 3-4. So a good veteran presence to bring in if they can't bring back one of Nick Perry or Dayton Jones if a guy like that leaves via free agency. But I still would be willing to bet that those guys are going to be their primary focus as far as uh, edge defenders. Yeah, I, I think I agree with you a little bit. I think it's an interesting fit, certainly. Uh, fits the mold of a potentially undervalued guy but who certainly would be in the in the vein of a um, a street free agent that doesn't mess with your compensatory pick situation. Uh, if they if they end up in a situation where they can add Barwin, you know, if they lose Perry, if they could add Barwin for four or five million bucks a year because somebody else paid Nick Perry ten or eleven, that's a cost analysis benefit that they're going to have to do. And so I think that it's, there is potential there. Maybe they trade for a seventh round pick for the guy if if they you know if Ted really likes him and prefers that he doesn't sign with somebody else. I, I but that's about the extent of it. I don't even think they go as high as a sixth. I think um, they use that too much on on developmental guys and special teams guys. Where if they're going to add Connor Barwin, they're going to try and do it with a a seventh round pick or even more likely wait for him to be released and add him as a street free agent. Cody, do you have any opinion on this uh, this buzz, I guess? Uh, no real opinion other than uh, 
Zach Cruz had wrote up a little piece kind of talking about what you guys were discussing and more likely you know, taking a chance on him when he becomes a street free agent. But uh, he, in the piece he mentioned, he only had 12 sacks in his last 30-some games. So he's 31 years old. He may have uh, peaked already, and he may be on this downside. Um, almost similar to a little bit like Julius Peppers, where you get someone on the tail end of their career. Obviously, Barwin is not Julius Peppers as far as you know how he's played up to this point of his career, but it could be like a nice little twilight to end uh, kind of Barwin's career if, if we were able to uh, lock him up for a couple-year deal and um, have, him, have him try to win a championship here in Green Bay. But, you know, as far as like you guys have mentioned, he's a good fit. I think he'd, he'd be part of the rotation immediately. I, I don't foresee a trade happening uh, for him. I think it'd be more likely when he's released if the Packers shows some interest. And that's only if the price is right. Let's switch gears here at least towards the position group that we're going to be discussing. Uh, let's talk about what you would do if, if uh, all hell broke loose and TJ Lang you know, gets eight, nine million bucks to go somewhere else and JC Trader gets eight, nine million bucks to go somewhere else. What's your plan of attack uh, if, if that were to happen and they have to come up with a completely different plan at left guard? Right guard, excuse me. Well, let me say, uh, these are things that I'm not even the general manager of the Packers. I'm not the head coach, and I'm certainly not the quarterback, and that's something that you should all be very thankful for. And these are things that still keep me awake at night, and I think these are very real possibilities. Um, And that's unfortunate, but I was looking at, you know, some free agents to see maybe if they could replace TJ Lang and Treader with another guard. And there's just not a lot of options there. Um, And it just, there's not a really a good option there. I almost think, you know, we were kind of talking about this a little bit last week. You're almost looking at your options being like Don Barclay, which anybody who listens to pulse of the back kind of knows my opinion on him or any, anything I've really ever done. My opinion on Don Barclay is not very high. Kyle Murphy, a raw second-year player. I think your best course of action, without knowing how the draft's going to play out, is this sucks because you're moving an all-pro caliber player in this scenario, but I think your best option is to move Brian Bulaga to play guard and have Jason Spriggs play right tackle. That's what I think I would do in that scenario, which is the worst possible scenario uh, in this situation, and this is literally, Ross, that's what you're saying, is all hell breaks loose. But I think Jason Spriggs is better suited as a tackle. Uh, you've seen him. He's long. He's lean. He, I don't, he held his own at guard, but I don't think he's a guard in the long-term future. He's a tackle. Brian Balaga is better suited to play guard. There are some people uh, who thought that he was going to be better suited as a guard when he came out as a tackle out of Iowa because of his arm length and some of the other stuff. I think he's better – suited as a guard of those two players. That's not an ideal situation because he is a very good right tackle, and we saw that last season. He was healthy for the majority of the year, played a very good right tackle, and was an all-pro caliber player. It's not a good or ideal situation, but if the Packers can't bring back Lang or Treader, there's not really a good option at this standpoint. I don't know if starting a rookie that you have to pick in the top 100, which is probably what they would have to do, Uh, in that scenario, and I don't know who that would be at this standpoint. I don't think starting Kyle Murphy, a sixth-round pick, and throwing him into the Wolves is the best idea, and I really don't think starting Don Barclay in any scenario is a good idea. So it's unfortunate, but I think that's the best course of action is starting Jason Spriggs at right tackle and having to displace Brian Balaga, and then you're starting to talk about that musical chairs game that the Packers have. Really, their advantage last season was getting away from that to where You know, that's where the offensive line started to struggle in years past was when one injury caused a guy to move from right tackle to right guard and left tackle to left guard and, you know, that little musical chairs game, as I called it. But that's what I would do. It's not a good option. It's not an ideal option. But that's kind of the game that they're going to have to play. That's another reason I think that something they have to do. It's like we've always said. You can't let both of those guys walk, Treader or Lang. One of those guys has to be back in green and gold next season. Yeah, I don't disagree. I think that that probably does have to happen. I'm a little bit higher on this. I think um, this year's class of interior linemen, I don't have as much of a problem with. I think, you know, you're really in a situation where the tackles scare you. But 
I feel pretty good about, you know, like a Ronald Leary would be a great fit. Kevin Zeitler probably out of uh, Green Bay's range. But even even a, a guy like Larry Warford was a pretty darn good player uh, for the, the Detroit Lions. I, I don't have a problem with a lot of these guys that played the, uh, the interior of the offensive line. But I still think that as far as familiarity with the system – you know, you have an elite player in TJ Lang, or you have an extremely versatile player in JC Treader. It would really probably behoove the Packers to bring one of them back. Cody, what would you do if Lang and Treader were were both gone? And I guess my answer would be just to sign one of those other guards. Yeah, that's kind of what my my inclination would have been too. Is to if those guys are getting that kind of money, that means somebody out there. Uh, I like the three names you mentioned: Warford. Uh, Leary and Zeitler, even Warmack to some extent. Uh, he's a younger player, could still be uh, developing. I'm, I'm pretty sure the Titans are going to want to keep him, though, too. Uh, you know, you can't just let both those guys walk and not have some kind of contingency plan as far as paying somebody else in free agency. Uh, and then uh, Jacob had touched on it. One of the, you know, you're going to have to spend a, a top three or you know, one of your first three rounds on an interior offensive lineman, if that's the case, too, just in case one of those lower tier free agents don't work out or Kyle Murphy isn't quite ready. Um, I don't exactly agree that the shuffling of the line would be a, a good move, and I know, Jacob, you sounded like you have huge reservations on doing that, but uh, you know, it, it, it would create another need on your team and that you'd have to spend draft capital or, or explore outside options or free agency, which is just you know exactly what you don't want to do in an leading up to the draft and in an offseason. So uh, it would be a nightmare scenario. Uh, but, yeah, you'd have to look to one of the other free agents out there. You just can't go in without a starting – right guard, so uh, I'd look to uh, one of the other guys. All right, we're two weeks away from free agency here. Uh, we know, you know, that what Ted's track record is, but he's probably going to lose one of his free agents and, you know, one of his signees in Julius Peppers, and they're going to have 45-some-odd million dollars to work with here. Uh, if you were to pick one free agent as a, either a fit or a want, uh, and a fit, I mean, in the sense of, you know, potential street free agent, uh, somebody who's going to come in undervalued, someone that fits the Ted Thompson motif, or just someone that you'd like to see on the squad, uh, let me know. I guess my guy, I mentioned before, you know, we've talked about this on a number of occasions with the cornerback group. I really like Terrence Newman. I know he's 38. I would love to give him a one-year deal, um, draft two corners in the first five rounds, and then just you know infuse that entire position group with talent. But, you know, Newman was one of the best six or seven corners in football last year. And to get him to, you know, kind of take that Julius Peppers deal where it's like, hey, you know, you never did win a title. Let's, let's give you one more shot at it with the Packers here. I think that's something uh, that they could certainly, certainly try. And that's my guy there is Terrence Newman. Cody, how about you? Um, if I'm just shooting from the moon, pick anybody that I could. Probably be Melvin Ingram, outside linebacker for the Chargers. Um, just a younger player, still got a lot of good football out of him. Has been coming on lately. Uh, his last season, he had 11 sacks. He gets after the quarterback. He makes plays. He forced six fumbles last year. Just, I, I wanted to say a cornerback like Gilmore or even Bowie, but you know, a good pass rush is going to make your secondary look better. And you know, with the uncertainty of Dayton and Perry, and then of course Peppers leaving. Potentially, it's just you need a you need a young pass rusher. I think he's going to get a ton of money, like crazy, stupid Von Miller, Justin Houston type money. Um, and, you know, I'd, I'd be hesitant to give him a lot of that. But if you can work it out where you know it's cap friendly, um, I, I would love to see him in green and gold and, and really solidify at the pass rush. Yeah, he even potentially he he took that really that third year to fourth year leap that Nick Perry did but probably had an even better season than Perry did. Uh, maybe even took more of a leap, I think, is pretty clearly um, the superior target at this point. It's just the question of can you get Perry to take a little bit of a break to stay uh, where you would probably have to pay a premium to get Melvin Ingram to Green Bay. Jacob, who would you add to the squad? One of the stats that I was telling Cody before uh, we started talking was – that the Packers last season, Mike Daniels had 20 quarterback hurries out of the defensive line. The rest of the defensive line had nine of them. And those stats I got from Bill Huber's Packer report. 
And Kenny Clark had four of those quarterback hurries. Now, some of that is because of the way the Packers rotate their defensive line, and there's only two of them, and Mike Daniels plays a lion's share of those snaps. And the other guys kind of rotate in and out. I do like Dean Lowry. Uh, I do like Kenny Clark's potential as a young, young player. I think he came into the league as like 16 years old last year. Uh, and, you know, Latroy Guyon is uh, probably an average player that's probably headed more towards the downside of his career. I want to say, you know, obviously, you know, A.J. Bouye or Stefan Gilmore, if you're shooting for pie in the sky, you know, Cody said Melvin Ingram, obviously that's one guy. But one guy I do think is – a higher end free agent that could be somewhat realistic just because of his age. I think his market could dwindle a little bit and he kind of fits the prototype of a Packers defensive lineman is Calais Campbell out of Arizona. And that's, yeah. something they were interested in. that's someone they were interested in years ago when he signed his first contract with the Arizona Cardinals. And the idea of him rushing the passer from the middle with Mike Daniels you want to talk about solidifying your defensive line, that's a way to do it. And that is a defensive line group, something that was kind of under-discussed because of everything else that went wrong in that NFC Championship game is they were a worn-down group after that Dallas game going into that Falcons game. It just looked like a group that just had the wind completely taken out of their sails after that Dallas game. Calais Campbell would one at depth. And two, just add some punch to that pass rush in that front group and make the job of, you're talking about a Mike Daniels and Calais Campbell would be the B.J. Raji and Colin Jenkins group from 2010 on steroids. Uh, That would be a phenomenal nickel rushing tandem. I would love every part of that. And I don't. I don't think that that's completely realistic, but I do think it's somewhat realistic. If you want to talk about a free agent, I know it's a defensive lineman, so, you know, it's not an edge rusher and it's not a cornerback, which is kind of what you're going to see as the popular, quote-unquote, free agent to bring in because of those are the two biggest positions of need. But defensive line is kind of an undersold need of this team, too, just because of the way of – the way that this season ended, and Calais Campbell's a guy who, he's 30 years old, but he's still a very good player. And, Ross, I heard your reaction. That's the kind of player that if the Packers could have, that's two elite defensive linemen, something they haven't had. Colin Jenkins and B.J. Raji both played at an elite level in 2010, and the Packers haven't had defensive linemen play at an elite level since that 2010 season. That's something that that, that, that group would give them a potential to do in a 2017 level season. So Calais Campbell is my guy. If they can find a way to get him in green and gold, I think that would be a phenomenal pairing. Yeah. I actually had a chance to uh, hop on Railbird Central this morning. And we talked about uh, Christian Ringo and I, and I talked about the diversification of the defensive line in a sense of they finally added that long guy uh, in Dean Lowry. And I really think, you know, bringing Christian Ringo back is a big deal because it gives them another short, squatty, pass rush type uh, defensive lineman option besides just Mike Daniels. Now, Calais Campbell would further de- diversify the op- or the defensive line because he's so long. I mean, he's a completely different player than literally anything that uh, – Green Bay would have to offer on the defensive line. So I, I really love that idea. And I think it's, I mean, I don't know if it's uh, likely just because of who the general manager is, but it's feasible because I, I really do believe that the way Arizona's cap situation is right now, it's more likely than not that they're going to have to make a choice between Chandler Jones and Calais Campbell. And I, I'm not 100% sure, but I think Chandler Jones is the younger player. So it, there is the potential, certainly, for Arizona to go with him, in addition to the fact that he's an edge rusher, as opposed to uh, extending Campbell. So I, I like that take, and I'd be very, very excited about that as a potential signing. But let's dive into the offensive line. Uh, obviously, you know, a position that Green Bay is about as set as you can be uh, on the exterior. The tackles are... Both elite players, uh, Brian Bulaga is one of the probably six or seven best right tackles in football, and David Bakhtari is one of the best two or three left tackles in football. They also have, um, you know, 
one of the most athletically gifted uh, tackles to come out of, of the last two drafts, really, as their third guy. So they're, they're about as good as you. And honestly, I would what I think of Kyle Murphy as a fourth tackle is, is pretty exciting as well. So they're about as set as you can be a tackle and about as unset as you could be on the interior of the offensive line. You could get into a situation where uh, Corey Lindsley, neither him or Treader has been able to stay very healthy, and the stalwart of your interior offensive line could all of a sudden become Lane Taylor. And just two years ago, he was a guy that you were nervous when he was in the game. Cody, where in this in this particular draft are you looking to add an offensive lineman, if anywhere? I think if the value were to present itself, I think you're going to get a good chunk of the talented players in rounds two and three. I think you'd have to invest a second-day pick in getting one of the top uh, echelon guys on the interior. Um, judging, you know, again, this is always speculation on our part, but depending on the Lang and Treader situation, I would have no reservations about spending the, um, a third-round pick or potentially even a second-round pick on one of the one of the top-tier guys if they fell there. And when I say top tier, I'm talking Dan Feeney from Indiana, uh, Forrest Lamp from Western Kentucky, Pat Eifling from Ohio State. I think those guys are really a few of the guys, you know, in the second round, I, could, I would probably not bat an eye. I, they're more probably third round guys that I feel more comfortable taking there. As far as interior guys in the first round, there's none that really jump out to me. I think a lot of people are going to have Lamp rated as kind of a late round one guy. That's, that's kind of where I have him. But I would not, you know, I ideally like to take one in the first. And Ted Thompson's track record would tell, say otherwise as well, that he likes to find college love tackles, plug them inside, and that usually happens in the middle of rounds, rounds three through five. Um, and I, I wouldn't see any reason why that would change. That's usually where you can find some decent value. So uh, for me, I would be most comfortable uh, in rounds three and later. Uh, the right value would have to smack me in the face in order to be comfortable taking one of the second. But third round or later is where is where I could see uh, you know a sweet spot for the Packers taking one of these guys. Jacob, how about you? Yeah, I'm with Cody. I, I mean, it's it's hard to say. You know, with the Lang and Treader situation, it's one of those Ross. You said I think you said it really well last week when you said I need I need the Packers to not need to invest a top 100 pick in an offensive lineman just because of some of the other other positions in this draft of, you know, ideally if I can go into this draft of saying, you know, if I can get out of the first three rounds going edge corner tight end, for example, for me or corner edge tight end, whatever way you want to go. If I can get through the first three rounds like that, I'm a happy person. Whereas with, you know, if Lang and Treader are both gone, then, with the way I know that Ted Thompson typically builds a team, then you're almost forced to take one of those guys in, you know, one of the top, top 100 picks. And yeah, then I'm with Cody. You can take something in as early as the third round. Like you said, uh, the value there has to kind of hit you in the face in the second round, but otherwise the third round is probably around where you have to start really looking at some of those guys. And yeah, college left tackles moving inside. That's what, just about every single one of the offensive linemen that's been on the roster has done. Uh, you can see that, with the exception of Corey Lindsley played on the inside, but most of those guys have played left tackle in college and then kicked inside. Uh, that's the way that Ted Thompson typically does things. Uh, Lindsley, I think, is the only guy in the starting line last year that didn't play tackle in college. But uh, if you can find some value in the second round, say if Forrest Lamp, for example, is sitting there, and I'll get more on him later, but uh, that's the guy that, is sitting there in the second round and there's no value as an edge rusher or a corner, for example, whatever you don't take in that first round, then yeah, you can take that guy. And I don't think that that would be a bad pick. And if you plug him in and he's your starting right guard on the first day, whatever keeps Don Barclay out of the starting lineup on the first day of training camp and the first day of the regular season, Ross, as you said, they're about as unset as you can be on the interior because I know Lane Taylor performed well last season but he's still not a player that I think you can sit and say, yeah, I'm sold on him because of one pretty good season, uh, but I don't think that I sit back and say, yeah, I'm sold on that uh, just because of one pretty good season. So, yeah, the third round and then a little bit later is where I'm starting to look at offensive linemen, unless value really presents itself there in the second round. 
Yeah, I, I'm kind of back to like the old Ted Thompson drafts where uh, he felt like he was pretty good at tackle with Tauscher and Clifton, eventually even Clifton and Bulaga, where during those times you know, he was taking um, – the, the TJ Langs, the Tony Malls, the Josh Sittens of the world, college tackles that could move and play guard and take them in round four, take them in round five. That That's about where, you know, we, we keep talking really about this six picks in the first five rounds type of deal. And that's right where I want to be. It's probably in that fifth round. Take one of the two picks to take an offensive lineman. I'd like to go back, um, maybe not to the Ron Wolf era where you take a quarterback every year. But I would like to go back to the Ted Thompson era where they take one offensive lineman every year and, and try to uh, continue to add weapons to to what they're doing up front. I don't think that that's a, a bad strategy at all. So, yeah, right right there um, in, in that round four, round five, I'd like to stay out of the top 100 picks just um, because I think this is a Super Bowl caliber program right now. And so uh, the first 100 picks, I, I'd like to be needs-based. And I, I know that's poten- you know, potentially not likely, especially with a guy like uh, Ted Thompson still steering the ship. But that's how I'd like to do it. And so you know, the question asked me, and that's my answer. Uh, who are the popular guys in that round? For me, you know, I'm talking about the guys that would be a uh, tackle slash guard, a guy like... Uh, Taylor Morton from Western Michigan, that 6'5 length, not the 6'6 six, 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 six length. Deion Dawkins of Temple, um, guys that can play multiple positions across the line. Even a Greg Pike from Georgia, uh, I, I really think is a right tackle that could play some guard. Kind of reminds me a little bit of Kyle Murphy, actually. So that that's sort of the guys that I'd be looking at. Cody, how about your... Uh, target there a little bit earlier than mine. Sure. I mean, Pat Alfrein is one of my favorite uh, interior offensive line prospects. If he's there in the third and say we address the corner and an uh, edge rusher, that would be you know a really nice pick, I think, to pair up him with his former teammate, Lindsey. Um, that could be a really good duo up front, uh, both in run blocking and pass protection. I think Feeney and Lamp are as good as gone. Uh, Ethan Posick, the six foot seven center from LSU, he's an interesting you know prospect because he's such a tall guy for an interior that you think that you know teams would probably look at him to tackle, but you know that also kind of screams to the versatility that Thompson likes to love to look at when he takes offensive linemen. It's a guy who could play inside, who's had experience at it, but could also kick outside if, if need be too. So he's someone in the third round. That's about my cutoff. Um, Later guys, I, I really like as far as the developmental guys. Uh, Javarius Lehman from South Carolina State. For whatever reason, I, I got onto him early this year before the season started. Read up onto him. He's just a freak athlete. I think he's going to have a really good combine. He originally was supposed to go to Clemson. I believe he's academically ineligible. Something to keep an eye on uh, next week during the uh, in Indianapolis at the combine. Uh, Julian Davenport is another interesting, uh, big offensive tackle. A guy who draft Twitter really kind of likes is Antonio Garcia, uh, just kind of a mean, nasty player from Troy, 6'6". He's under 300 pounds, uh, and he does have trouble anchoring. You can tell he needs to uh, get some more stand in the pants. But those are guys that are later around uh, developmental types that I think you know can you know, eventually become something. And Garcia, I think uh, he's probably more of a fourth round, third to fourth round guy as well where – you know, you give him a little time in the weight room, he could develop into a good tackle or even inside the guard. So just a few guys in the middle of the late rounds that uh, that I like of uh, expecting big things next week out of him. Jacob, we're going to move along a little bit here just because you and Cody were sort of in the same area. In the round that you're looking for a guy, who's your favorite guy? Well, I love Lamp. And I promised I would make that reference, so I did. Uh, Forrest Lamp out of Western Kentucky. I mean, um, spoiler alert for everybody that's going to get the Cheesehead TV draft guide, that's going to be my number one interior guy out of Western Kentucky. I think this is a guy, Cody, I think your mock draft had him going in the first round, I believe, to Seattle, if I'm not mistaken. Cool. Uh, yeah, okay, so that's a guy. That wouldn't surprise me at all uh, if he ends up being a first-round pick. He was a left tackle. Uh, in college, 
He's my number one rated interior offensive lineman. Uh, I think this is a guy who can play anywhere from left guard all the way out to right tackle. I have him rated as highly as I had Cody Whitehair last year. Uh, I really like him coming out. Uh, Cody Whitehair was phenomenal for the Chicago Bears as a center last season. Uh, He was a really good player for them on the interior. I think he really solidified that interior offensive line for the Chicago Bears along with uh, Josh Sitton and Kyle Long. That's a strength for the Bears going into next season, in my opinion. Uh, Forrest Lamp is definitely, I think, the best player at that position. Uh, I just don't know if if he gets out of the first round. I definitely think he's a top 40 pick. Uh, you mentioned some of the other guys. Uh, Ethan Pochitz out of uh, LSU is another guy there. Dan Feeney out of Indiana. Something you guys will notice, if there's something that I am a little old school with when it comes to offensive linemen, I know the theme is kind of zone blocking, and that's kind of something the Packers do. I like maulers. Um, I like aggressive blockers. Uh, and that's uh, Pat Elfline out of Ohio State. Definitely fits the bill there. He's an aggressive guy with his hands. Uh, gets to the second level. Guys that play to the whistle. Guys that put guys on the ground. Uh, those are the kinds of guys that I tend to really like. Um, and they get to the point of attack. They use their hands aggressively. Maybe that leads to some penalties. Uh, but I don't mind necessarily aggressive penalties. Um because I think that's something you can coach out of them. But those are some guys that I really like, and I think that those are all guys that I mentioned, other than Lamp specifically, uh, that you can get in that second to third round range. Um, and then, yeah, like I mentioned, you can get some later on guys when I talk to some undervalued. But those are three guys that I really like in that second to third round range that the Packers can get on their interior. I don't know if they can necessarily start right away, uh, but you can absolutely get some good value for them in that second or third round, really outside of Forrest Lamp. But uh, if that guy slips to the Packers' second-round pick, I wouldn't bat one eye one bit if they picked him right there in that second round. Cody, who's your favorite player in the round that you would like to target? Would that be somebody that we've mentioned already, in the Pat Alslide? And I talked about him enough, and Jacob did too. Just the versatility, played center, played guard, and was just highly successful at both spots. So I, I just he just screams, uh, you know, successful interior lineman. I think he's a plug and play type of guy. Uh, I, I don't know why some people are thinking third round. I, I'm, I'm hoping that it's third round for him, but I, I wouldn't I wouldn't be surprised if he's a top fifty pick for some team. So, uh, but you know, that this might pipe dream almost that is somewhat realistic with Pat Offside. I think my favorite guy of the round, the, the rounds that I'm looking for a little bit later, would be Morton from Western Michigan. Really, I think is kind of that TJ Lang build. Um, probably a guy six five three thirty. You're going to want to move into guard. Uh, played in the MAC, same as Lang. I, I he was a, a good player there, and I think really has the uh, the size to. To fit in right away, either at right guard or right tackle. I don't think you have, you have any interest of in playing him at left tackle, but uh, really either guard spot or the, or the right tackle, I think, would be um, really a lot of fun and 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 to be able to plug in, play him all over the place, provide that uh, interior backup that Green Bay is likely going to lose. Uh, you know, if they end up with. Treader as a starter with Lang gone, or Lang as a starter with Treader as a backup gone, uh, it's it's going to be a player I think that that would be able to slide right in and cover all those positions. Uh, if potentially you know Kyle Murphy was not able to slide in and project all those positions, as far as and we'll move on to the next point here. My favorite offensive lineman in this class is Ryan Ramchick from Wisconsin. Uh, and once again, I have to go with the disclaimer that I'm not from Wisconsin. I have no affiliation with the University of Wisconsin. I know there's some people that um, think Cam Robinson is clearly the best offensive lineman in this class. Uh, I, I just I take issue with that. I, I don't think that he's a guaranteed left tackle. Uh, there are weaknesses in his game that bug me. Ramchick, I really thought, uh, was an exceptional player all year long. I think he can play left tackle in the NFL. I think you know he's got probably at 6'6", 297, a lot of the David Bakhtiari disease in that He'll be an excellent pass blocker the first day on the job, but as he hangs 10, 15, 20 pounds of frame, gets into an NFL strength and conditioning program, can round out his game and become you know an elite player. 
Um, Jacob, who's your favorite offensive lineman in this class, period? It's kind of funny you mentioned Ramchick and David Bakhtiari because I was going to make the same disclaimer. I'm not a Wisconsin uh, football fan, and uh, David Bakhtiari is one of the things I've said about him is good pass blocker on the first day. Uh, not so sure about um, run blocking, but, yeah, as he gets a little more lead in his pants – uh, and an NFL weight room, I think that he could add that to it. It's kind of funny we're thinking of a Wisconsin player needing to add <laughs> to his run blocking ability because pass blocking is not exactly what they do at Wisconsin, but that's something that he needs to improve on. But yeah, I'm with you as far as number one offensive tackle. Um, I really like him there, but yeah, the majority of my uh, offensive lineman uh, study has certainly gone to the interior because that's what. Uh, what my assignment's been for the uh, Cheesehead TV guide and the Packers need has definitely been uh, the interior as opposed to the exterior. So Forrest Lamp, I've said enough about him. Uh, I love him. I can't resist the Anchorman reference, uh, but I don't need to make it again because that'll drive me in the ground. But Forrest Lamp, Ryan Ramchek, you want to go both sides. I think they're one and one A. Forrest Lamp, I think they're both day one starters, uh, plug and play guys. Forrest Lamp can play anywhere except left tackle, and I think Ryan Ramchek's a day one. Uh, left tackle and I'm with you on Cam Robinson there's uh, weaknesses in his game and I almost wonder if he's a guy that might end up better suited at guard and there's people that are mocking him in the top 10-ish of drafts and that's a guy who you know you do you pick a guy that could eventually play guard for you in the top 10 that's a guy you know there was a guy they did that for uh, his name was Greg Robinson who came out of Auburn the same sort of thing happened to him and that didn't turn out so good so uh, yeah, Ryan Ramchuk as far as tackles, and then, yeah, Forrest Lamp. So I guess I gave you two guys, but um, I gave you one for each spot. So those are my two guys. Cody, your favorite offensive lineman in this class? You know, this class is just generally weak. I don't think we hammered home that point well enough. The offensive tackle class is one of the thinnest it's been in recent memory. I'm really grateful that Ted Thompson got Jason Spriggs last year in the second round. I think Spriggs would probably be tackle one in this year's class. Hell, he was tackle, I believe, two for me last year. So I'm grateful that Thompson secured and has a great backup swing tackle from last year. Um, this year, I mean, I'm a, I like Ramchek. I think he's all right. I like Robinson. Garrett Bowles is an interesting name, although a little bit older. Motown Garcia. Some guys we mentioned, interior guys. Uh, just I don't. It's hard for me to pinpoint one hands down. I guess I'll still stick with Pat offline, but again, just – Really want to reiterate the point that Thompson, whether he knowingly did it or not, and you know I wouldn't put it past him in, in the whole department. Realizing of what a thin class this tackle class was is probably wisely traded up last year to take Spriggs, knowing that this this year was weak. Okay, uh, we'll we'll just go right into it. Who do you think is the most undervalued offensive lineman in this class? Okay, I'll go ahead and start. So, for whatever reason, I've always had this kind of affinity for uh, offensive guards who are who are just maulers, who are big, almost round balls of muscle. Let's hear in, in past. I liked Larry Warford coming out of Kentucky. I liked Gabe Jackson out of Mississippi State last year. It was Sebastian Trintola out of Arkansas. This year, the guy who kind of fits that mold is Nico Saragusa, who is uh, Tony. You know, Saragusa, the famous nose tackle from the Baltimore defense uh, in 2000. It's his son. Uh, he played at San Diego State, and he was just blowing open holes for Donald Humphrey constantly. He was a guy who was just a mean mother, you know, put you in a phone box, put you on your butt, get to the second level, just run run guys over and clear paths. I think, uh, you know, it doesn't exactly fit the Packers' offensive system, but you put him on a team that, you know, implements a power run scheme like that, I think he could find success pretty early. Uh other, other under, uh, underappreciated guy that I just want to mention one more time, I think, is Javarius Lehman from that South Carolina State. I, I think he's you know, a great athlete who just needs some really good coaching and some molding. But he could have uh, a potential Taron Armstead upside, I'd say. Uh, and that's pretty lofty. But as a late-round pick, I think you can do much worse for a guy. Uh, you know, His ceiling is, is really, really high. So uh, just those two guys are kind of guys that I think are a little bit under the radar right now. But... Uh, could have bright futures in the NFL. Jacob, the most undervalued offensive lineman in the class? Cody, I didn't want to do this, but since you took my guy of Siragusa, I'll pick somebody different for the sake of uh, giving somebody else's name. But 
somebody whose name he was a five star recruit when he was signed in recruiting, and that was Kyle Kalis uh, out of Michigan, and that was he was mentioned as a guy who was supposed to be like the next big thing uh, when he was signed, and it didn't quite turn out that way. He was a day one starter when he was signed, and then kind of got a sense of entitlement when he was there um, because he was day one starter as a freshman and Brady Hoke didn't do a very good job of coaching the kid up and then eventually uh, got benched and then kind of had some odd season out of that. And then his junior and senior season when he was a different coaching staff was brought in, obviously uh, developed, kind of came into his own there. He's mentioned as a seventh round pick. He was Michigan's best offensive line in the last two seasons. It wasn't a very good offensive line the last two years. But Kalis actually had a pretty solid East-West Shrine game. This is a guy who's looking at a seventh-round selection. He added 13 pounds uh, between his junior and his senior season. Another guy, like I mentioned, he's a bit of a mauler. Uh, He looks the part of a guard. Uh, He's 6'4". He's about 305 pounds. But, again, he's a guy who has a bit of that mean streak. He has a bit of that nasty to him. And he's a guy who, again, wants to put people on the ground. So that's the kind of guy that I'm going to like to do that. Again, if you want – uh, Ross, the guy you mentioned earlier was Greg Pikes. There's two other guys. This is a guy who's mentioned kind of in the sixth or seventh round. Those are guys I would take in the fifth round, and I don't think I would have any trouble with picking either one of those guys. So, yeah, Greg Pike out of Georgia, I'd play that guy at guard, and I would play Kyle Kalis at guard. And those are guys I'd take in the fifth round, and they're mentioned as sixth or seventh round picks. So there's some undervalued guys for you. Yeah, my undervalued guy, I haven't done this yet uh, this year, but it was a guy I covered at North Dakota State, Zach Johnson on the left guard is a guy who be, was absolutely dominant um, at the East-West Shrine game and then had a knee injury. It was just an MCL. He'll be able to take part in NDSU's Pro Day. Um, I'm guessing he will probably be a priority free agent. Uh, he's a draftable player. I think I would take him in round five and moving on. He His upside is a starting left guard in the NFL. That's the end of the sentence. He is so nasty, um, so physical. You want to talk about a Mahler, just turn on turn on the Iowa tape. And those are good defensive tackles. Jaleel Johnson is a guy that I'm going to talk about when we talk about guys that had foot, uh, guys that had fit in a, in a 3-4, diversifying the defensive line with some length. Just watch some Zach Johnson film, and, and you'll see uh, exactly what I'm talking about. So, I haven't stumped for an NDSU guy yet, uh, but but this is a guy that's a priority free agent probably that should more than likely be a fifth or a sixth round pick. So, last question we always ask, always talking about those first six or the the six picks in the first five rounds. Um, Jacob, what is the likelihood that the Packers draft an offensive lineman in their first six picks? Well, I believe that Ted Thompson has selected an offensive lineman in every draft since he's been a Packers general manager. It's either every draft or all but one. So I'll have to check after we're done here to make 100% sure on that. It's either every draft or all but one. So, I mean, first first six picks in the first five rounds, it's got to be close to 100%. So I'm going to go 95% uh, because that's, that's what he does. Uh, he picks an offensive lineman – Every single year, and it's not because um, – it's not like he's picking these guys in the sixth or seventh round either. Uh, and I think that, you know, even if they bring back Lang or Treader, I don't think they're bringing back both. Um, they still need some depth because they're losing one of those guys. And as you said, you know, they're about as not set on the interior as you could be. Corey Lindsley is a guy who hasn't been able to stay very healthy. If Lang is the guy that they bring back, they don't have a backup center currently on the roster that has played in a game. Uh, and if they bring back Treader, then you assume that Treader is the backup center and then they need somebody who could step in and potentially play guard. Now, whether that's Kyle Murphy or somebody else remains to be seen, but they still need somebody that could come in and play depth. So 95% because Ted Thompson, it's similar to the Ron Wolf of picking quarterbacks. Ross, you used that example earlier. Ted Thompson picks offensive linemen every single year. That's what he does. That number is very, very high. I would bet – I'm not going to say I'd bet my house on it, uh, but I would bet just about anything uh, that they're going to pick an offensive lineman uh, in those first six picks. Uh, So 95% is my number. Yeah, I'm up at 80. I'm with you. Um, I'd be surprised. 
with the the sitting dismissal, basically, uh, and then the, the Treader and Lang situations. If they don't add an offensive lineman uh, before round six, I, yeah, I'd be pretty surprised. Cody, what are your thoughts? I would go a little bit lower just to – there's so many other needs that they could address that I, I wouldn't be scared if they didn't take one before then. I, I'd go at like 65%, and Jacob really just hammered home the point. It's just kind of Thompson's MO to really track one in those middle rounds and, and hope you pan out. I hope he pans out. So I'll go 65 all right, that'll do it for us. Uh, we'd like to thank you guys once again for listening to the Packers War Room Offseason Podcast. I'd like to thank Jacob and Cody for the time, of course. You can catch my work at Cheesehead TV and uh, PackersTalk.com. I'll be making my triumphant return to both sites uh, this Friday and the following Monday. And you can catch Jacob at FanRag. You can catch Cody uh, in the Cheesehead TV Draft Guide and at CheeseheadTV.com as well. Uh, Thank you guys once more, and go back, go. Go back, go.